Yes, absolutely. All right, I'll give a, I wanna introduce uh, America Scores Bay Area. America Scores is a national um, nonprofit and we're in 11 cities um, in the United States and in Vancouver. And we, in America Scores Bay Area, we have a three-prong approach to our nonprofit, which is serving an after-school underserved youth. It's soccer, poetry, and service learning. And um, in going with that, I'd like to read a poem written by Jimena, who is in fifth grade. And this is called, That Is That. In soccer, I like scoring. I give the strongest kick to the ball. My coach is not snoring. The referee makes a loud call. I think halftime is boring. I just want to play and give it my all. The goalie blocks the shot. He is as fast as a cat. My cleats hit the ground, splat, splat, splat. I like soccer and that is that. So that's just one of the 40,000 poems written by America's Scores poet athletes. So we just like to um, give that as an example. Um, I would like to thank our sponsors and partners, Women in Soccer. And I will put the URL in the chat box. Um, they just had their launch party today and free membership. So please, anyone in soccer, sign up. It's an awesome organization. Goal Five is our other partner and they are kindly going to give us a giveaway at each session. So one lucky audience participant is going to get some product. Um, I am gonna turn it over to Carrie Taylor who is the technical advisor for the Jamaican national team and the former assistant coach with the San Diego Loyals from the USL. And Carrie has been a awesome <laughs> speaker, moderator, interviewer for us at SCORE. So we love having her and I'm gonna let you go ahead and take it over. Awesome. Thanks, Carrie. Awesome, thank you, Alicia. Uh, and thank you to America Scores. I am super excited today and thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Um, we are gonna talk about not coaching, not um, playing. We're gonna talk about other careers within soccer for women. Um, super excited to have three really special guests, uh, Calista, Sheila, and Tori. And I'm going to let each of you explain who you are and what you do within the game. But um, just again, so excited and I can't wait to learn from you and just to uh, have you share your knowledge to all of our listeners. So uh, Calista, why don't we start with you? Hi everybody and thank you Carrie for being our great moderator and Alicia for our, you know putting on this great event. Um, my name is Calista Tyree as Carrie said. I am the director of media and PR with Path to Pro Soccer, a soccer agency out of the Bay Area. And then I'm also the sideline reporter for the Oakland Roots, which is a professional team out of Oakland, California, now going into the USL League. Sheila? Hi guys, thank you so much for having me. I'm the head athletic trainer for uh, Sounders Development Program, which um, is USL team Tacoma Defiance and Sounders Academy. And we also have younger group called SDP, Sounders Discovery Program. So I oversee about 60 to 80 athletes. Thanks, Sheila. Tori? Yeah, thank you everybody for joining and thanks for America Scores for putting it on. Um, Carrie, appreciate your help in moderating and I'm super thrilled to be here. Um, so I kind of hold two roles. I'm a professional soccer official. So I um, had the luxury, I suppose, of officiating the MLS this year and being the first woman in 20 years to do it. Um, so here to tell you officiating can be a career. And then I'm also the managing director for NISOA, which is our collegiate uh, body of officials. So uh, we have about 5,000 members and we oversee all the officials um, that handle the collegiate game. So a little bit of a leadership position, the first time a female has held that role or any leadership role within the NISOA organization as well. So excited to be here. Great. Thank you, Tori. Um, Kalista, back to you. Can you kind of talk about what like, your role is on the everyday. So, you know, when you think of, you know, social media and marketing and sideline reporting, um, for people that want to get into that, 
role can you kind of share with what a day looks like for you and some of the things that you do within within your job? Yeah, of course. Um, so basically, I just want to start off by saying that media has a lot of components to it. I got my degree in communication just because I thought that that was the most easiest way to get into obviously talking. I wanted to be a sideline reporter growing up. But now getting into sports in the world of media, there's social media, there's video production, you know, there's broadcasting, there's so many ways to get into it. And I've kind of just stuck my head in every single panel that I could get into. Um, so with Path to Pro, I'm director of media, obviously. Within that role, I have so many jobs to name. Um, but first of all, I am, obviously I interview players at our combines that we put on twice a year, one in January, one in the summer. Um, I interview 20 plus athletes that are um, participating in our combines um, on the span of one to two days, depending on COVID restrictions and stuff like that. Um, I just love to interview players, get their stories out there on our social media pages. And with that going, I edit my videos, I edit all my interviews, my pictures, and I get them ready to be posted on social media. And then I've also gone along into making highlight videos for players that either come perform in our combines or um, our our agency players that are signed to our combine. They have great seasons and they have these amazing goals, amazing like seasons and we want to just promote them on YouTube as much as possible. Um, other than that, I am the, pa pa the sorry, Path to Pro podcast host. Um, I just barely started that. We You can check that out on Apple iTunes podcast and Spotify. Um, I'm also the co-creator. I'm working um, alongside our CEO of making our first ever women's pro combine. That's a huge, huge thing for us. We're very excited in January. We'll have women's players coming out to get their chance of getting looked at by multiple pro teams. Um, and then just, you know, being every day, you're in contact with professional teams, coaches, you know, front staff offices to, you know, just keep an eye on our guys and make sure that they're getting the best, um, you know, help and everything within that. And I'm also a scout without the pro. So I just, at the combines, I like to scout out players and I know players from college that, you know, might want to come to the combines and that's basically, that's all of it in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, that's a great summary. Thank you for that. And what I, what I just realized without even thinking about it is all four of us work in men's sports as women. And that's pretty cool without even thinking about it. When I asked all of you to be on the panel, I was like, let's talk about different roles. And now I'm just having that realization that like, we've all broken barriers. So we're pretty kick-ass women here. <laughs> uh, Sheila, can you share with the listeners uh, what like it's your, you know, you're with Tacoma Defiance on the sidelines. And I, I was, it was great to see you when Loyal played and, you know, you and I go back to, to 2012. So it was, it was great to see you in your element, what you're doing on the sidelines. But can you talk more about what a day in the life of Sheila looks like with overseeing all the, the youngsters and, and what goes into to being um, not only with the players, but with a staff? The communication is key for my job. So, you know, um, I communicate with our coaches and players, even though I have 80 players, um, I try to communicate with them as often as possible. And um, I provide injury report, rehab progress report to coaches. And we also include um, some of the front office staff so that they know what's going on with our club or group um, and, and daily you know, work as an athletic trainer, starting from 7 a.m., getting our training room set up for training sessions and um, leading pre-activation sessions for our players so that they can be ready for training sessions. And um, our players submit their report for, you know, quality of sleep, stress level, soreness, and all those kind of, um, you know, self-report. And I put that together and um, communicate with the coaches or players, whatever it needed. Mm -hmm. And the game day, you know, I'll be on the <laughs> sideline in training room and, and just being an athletic trainer. Yeah. And I have a wonderful assistant, three assistants. So they really helped me doing my job. Great. Thank you. So Tori, 
share with us what a day in the life uh, of a referee looks like. And, you know, previous to jumping on, you were saying you were talking about the fitness test that you have to take. So I think a lot of us in soccer don't really understand what the referees actually do in the prep work and things like that. So can you talk a little bit more about about that? Sure. And thanks for acknowledging that, Carrie. Yes. Seriously, <laughs> uh, seriously, last week you blew my mind about <laughs> knowing like players' tendencies and who has cards and who has these tendencies. So please reshare because yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was, no, it was inspiring. <laughs> good. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, there's definitely more to officiating than showing up on the pitch and with a whistle and some cards. Um, there's a lot that goes into it and listening to Sheila talk about the self-reporting. Um, we do that at the professional levels. Uh, we turn in every morning. I wake up, I take my HRV. Um, and then I also self-report how I'm feeling, how well I slept, um, if I'm sore from previous trainings, all the way to like, do I have a cough uh, and how I'm feeling. Uh, and then our sports science team will adjust our training based on our self-reported um, data. So I'm sure a team just like Sheila is working diligently behind the scenes. Um, to make sure that we have training that is um, effective for us given our schedule. So whether we have a game that week or whether we have a fitness test, I just happen to be fitness testing this weekend in Atlanta. So I am kind of, today was my last hard day and I'm gonna start to taper off my training, uh, but we train six days a week. Um, everything from interval to sprint training to capacity building um, and then you know weightlifting and a combination of those um, kind of throughout. So heavy, I usually spend about two hours in the gym is a typical workout from warm up to the training and actual cool down. Um, so pretty heavy load there. Um, and then a lot of technical uh, training as well. So we watch a lot of videos. We take a lot of video quizzes, a lot of discussions. So referees, um, well, we are always in the public eye and always judged at, by the public. We also get behind closed doors and kind of argue with each other about our own decisions. So not only do we have to defend them in the public eye uh, and to players and to coaches in the moment, but we also have to defend them to our colleagues um, or raise our hand and say, hey guys, we made a mistake. So uh, all of our decisions are scrutinized. I mean, in the MLS, there's up to 36 camera angles on wow. a decision. So talk about the pressure um, there, you know, we say we're kind of in a fishbowl. There is no hiding anymore. Maybe back in the day they could make up decisions, but in today's reality, we have VAR and it's a very high pressure uh, environment. And so it takes a really strong minded person to be able to maintain um, the mindfulness required to be able to uh, officiate in today's environment. And I, I was just telling the crew kind of behind the scenes before we jumped on, um, I'm kind of in a frantic mindset right now as I'm preparing for my fitness test because it tends to be a mental hurdle for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so mindfulness is a big part of officiating as well. And how do you balance um, life and how do you uh, kind of come back when you make bad decisions? How do you effectively self-evaluate when you make bad decisions, right? It's one thing if you miss a shot, right? Mm -hmm. It's another thing if you miss a penalty kick decision and the team that advances uh, doesn't get an opportunity that maybe they, they should have, right? And so you know, when you have big decisions like that in a match, they stick with you for a while. So being able to evaluate and self-reflect on um, your games and be able to be critical of those analysis and learn from those mistakes is what makes some of the best officials. So we watch a lot of film, both in preparation and heading into a game. So I'll look at film of the teams, the matchups, the players, the tendencies. Um, and then we'll also look at our own film post um, games and do a lot of evaluation. I do my own post analysis and I report it back to my coach and I let them know what I thought I did well and what I didn't. Um, and we take learnings across every critical decision we make. So a lot goes into officiating at the highest level. It's definitely not just showing up with a whistle and cards. <laughs> yeah, no. And I, I think that's super important. You know, you touched on you're in the fishbowl and there's so many people out there that they think they know, you know, things about coaching decisions and referee decisions and athletic trainer decisions like, oh, they're not hurt or whatever. And, and there's just so much that goes into each part of our jobs to, to get the athletes out there and, and have have the games go on and you know all of these pieces are important and, and that's again why it's important for women um, to think about the different career paths and what speaks to them and what their passions are within the sport that we all love and can't get enough of for some reason <laughs> so you know thank you for sharing all the all the things that go into all of your your roles um, I'm gonna just kind of keep going around in a circle here so Calista can you um, can you, you put something on social media the other day that really spoke to me and it was part of the reason why 
I asked you on this panel was you you said something about all the naysayers out there and like people telling have maybe told you that you couldn't do what you're doing and I, I'm putting you on the spot with this because I didn't prep you for this question but can you can you talk about that because I think that you know w within our careers that we have there's always people that are like you can't do that you can't you know be an athletic trainer in a men's program, or you can't be an MLS official. So can you kind of touch on that and maybe like why, why you feel that way? And, and I'm, you know, you're, you're a rock star and I want you to know that, but like talk about that feeling and, and maybe some challenges that you've gone through. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I appreciate that you actually pay attention to what I put on. I do. I do. <laughs> thank you for that. But as I've said on my social media pages, 100%, I want to use however small and however big, whatever my platform is to let the next girl know that she can do whatever I'm doing and she can also do whatever she wants to do within her life. We all make the decision to get up and make something of ourselves every single time we wake up. And I just feel like as an athlete, I played, I also played, I was in the women's game, as I said, my, my whole life until my sophomore year of college and just setbacks have always been a part of life and just people doubting you is also a part of life. Um, I just remember like I tore my ACL my sophomore year and I was already getting looked at by college scouts and stuff like that. And somebody made a comment to me at school that, oh, you're not gonna come back as the same player that you were before. And it's just like little things like that. It just, it really messes with your mental state, you know? And I just took that and I just made it a fuel. And he was also an athlete, the boy that said that to me. And I was the one that got recruited to play to college and it wasn't him. So it, it's just like, kind of like a high like moment, you know? And then just getting into, into like after graduation with, I was blessed enough to get, you know, the opportunity with Path the Pro, which led to my opportunity with Oakland Roots. Like, at school, when I was working with St. Mary's, there was so many other people uh, in my job, um, in my internship that got so much more opportunities to do other things um, that I just wasn't given the opportunity to do them. So I just waited and I continued to learn and I just saw like my boss's decision of not putting me in the position that I wanted to be as an opportunity to just learn and reflect and I just take all my adversity and I try to just feel, that's like the one thing that fuels me. So when somebody tells me I can't do something. Mm -hmm. And I remember specifically at a school event, I went to a, it was a kind of like a panel like this. It was about me working in media and sports media specifically. And I asked a man this question because he had worked like in sports radio. And I said, well, how do you get into this? I, I don't know how, you, how to get into sports media. What do you recommend I do? And he said, well, you're not an athlete anymore. So there's probably not going to be any room for you in sports media because usually athletes get into sports media. So it's just, I don't know. It's just, tell, don't tell me that I can't do something because then I'm going to go ahead and do it. And I, I want to prove you wrong. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and I think we've probably all come across similar challenges, but you know, good, good for you for chasing your dreams and, and keep on, keep on doing that. Um, Sheila, can you talk about maybe some challenges or situations that you've had, um, you know, within your profession, working with male athletes on the on the day in and day out, and anything that you've had to kind of overcome uh, with your work? Well, I grew up with a lot of brothers, and I don't have sisters, <laughs> so I never really had any issues working with male athletes or coaches. You know, I think it's important that you know who you are and you stay true to yourself. And, you know, whether you talk to male athletes or female athletes, I stay the same, really. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm always stay true to myself and, and, and the message I give to my players are the same. And so, you know, I don't really have any issues. That's great. <laughs> That's great. And it, it just show, I mean, it just shows like everybody's path is different. There's, yeah. you know, certain you can, you know, you can have great people around you and be in a great environment where there's never an issue. And then you can have naysayers and having to overcome challenges. And, you know, I can attest to Sheila's always the same. We've known each other for a while and, and she's just no nonsense. And, 
gets the job done and you know like I love this woman to death and I just it's so great to see um all that you're doing and have done and I, you've worked and done some work in Japan as well right yes and and also when I work with Seattle rain now it's OL rain I yeah. translate it so oh okay you know I, I'm here just to help athletes in in any way I can you know if Japanese players were looking for opportunity to play in U.S. You know, if I can help, I, I help and, you know, vice versa. If American players wants to go to Japan and play, mm -hmm. you know, if I can help with anything, I'm there. And, you know, Japan is starting their professional league next year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, American side and, and Japanese side, we can all learn from each other, you know professional league is is difficult to um, be stable mm -hmm. so you know yeah, the experience the U.S. players have in the past is great for the Japanese players to learn from mm -hmm. and so you know outside of what I do with Seattle Sounders you know, I'm just here to help any athletes reach their goals that's awesome and you, you have such a big heart. Like, I love it. I love it. I love it. Tori, challenges. I know, I know you've, you've had a, a few and had people tell you that maybe you shouldn't be doing this or you can't pass a fitness test. Can you, can you talk about maybe some of the challenges that, that you've overcome within your job? Sure. I'm going to knock on wood first. Since it's yeah. the test thing. <laughs> oh, sorry. You're that, sorry. You're going to rock it out, sister. I know this. I know this. You're good. You're good. Uh, yeah, no, I, I can share uh, some of the experiences uh, that you guys have already said, just as far as those naysayers. Maybe we had some of the same naysayers there, Khalees. I'm not sure. But um, you yeah, definitely had plenty of people that told me along the road, you can't, um, you won't, that's not possible. Um, things of that nature. And, you know, likewise, it was really motivation for me, you know, it felt like the more people that told me no, and you can't, it was more like motivation for me to say, yes, I can, I'm gonna find a way. And if it's not this way, I'll try this way. And if it's not going to work this way, I'll try that way. Um, but I had, you know, even females, um, mm -hmm. very high up in the profession, tell me you can't have a family and do this. And I was like, why not? <laughs> I want to have my cake and eat it too, you know? Um, and it's not easy, but we find a way to do it. My husband is also a professional referee in the MLS as well. And we have oh. three small girls. Um, so we are a family of officials and we make it work. Uh, it's certainly not easy. There's a lot of travel. I think he was gone, um, 200 plus days last year. Mm -hmm. um, so there's just a lot of travel involved in it and it's not easy to make it work, but we do. Uh, and it's possible if you have something that you're passionate about and you love it, there's a way to make it happen. And if somebody tells you, no, cool, maybe it's not that way. It's going to be a different way though. And you can make it happen. You know, um, the women's body is amazing. I mean, we can we mm -hmm. make children, we make humans, right? <laughs> so to ever say that we can't do something, it's amazing what you can do if you just put your mind to it, you know? And a lot of it is just focusing on what it is that you wanna achieve. And, you know, I tell young up and coming uh, female officials, if they're taking the women's FIFA fitness test and they're doing it, that's amazing. Congratulations. Try and take the men's test. The sprint time's a little faster. The intervals are a little faster. See if you can achieve that. Strive for that. You know, I'm at a place where I feel really comfortable with the men's fitness test. Now I'm working with the men's World Cup times. And now I want to wow. shorten my intervals and shorten my speeds just a little bit faster. And can I do that and sustain that level um, and caliber? And it's physically very demanding. But if you focus on it um, mm -hmm. and you put your heart and soul into it, you, you'll find a way to make it happen. No matter what those people say. Mm -hmm. um, and don't let anybody tell you uh, that you can't or that you're too old or that you're a woman or whatever it is, these perceived obstacles that people put in front of us, they're mm -hmm. only there if you believe that they're there, right? You can find a way around them. So don't let people tell you that something um, is an obstacle. Uh, it only is if you believe it. Yeah, very, very, very well said and uh, very, very, very profound. And I didn't know that your husband's also an official. So that's 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 a lot of work-life balance with three children and both of you in the same career. How you know, what like how does that work? Do you schedule different games so you can cover different things? Like that's that's really interesting. Tell us more about yeah, that. We've actually had the opportunity to work on games together this year. Oh, which is that's super nice. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I look forward to more of that because I think it's just an interesting dynamic. Um, uh -huh. 
but uh, yeah, at the end of the day, like it's, it's really about balance. And I was on a, a podcast earlier today. And um, one of the things I said that uh, one of the gentlemen said he took away from it was, you know, one way that we approach it is we just say yes. And we figure out the details later. <laughs> like we don't let the children or we don't let our schedules stop us from being able to do something or take advantage of an opportunity. When we're given an opportunity, we say yes. And then we mm-hmm. figure out the details later. We can have my mom come, we can have a nanny, we, we can figure it out. You know, one of us will say no to something else to be able to balance it. But if we get a really cool opportunity, say yes and figure out the details later. Um, and that's one way that we've been able to kind of say yes and continue to grow and take advantage of opportunities because the more experience you get, uh, the more value you create in your own brand and the more value you become in the marketplace, whatever it is that your career is. So saying yes um, is really important to be able to get those experiences and exposure that make us all better uh, and challenge us all a little bit. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good thing to live by. Like say yes and, and like make the plan, execute the plan and go from there. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, Calista, if somebody wanted to do the job that you're doing, how does one go about it? Like, do you have to have a communications degree? Like, do you, do you can you get internships? So can you kind of talk about like the pathway to being a silent reporter or being in social media and everything? Yeah, of course. So my true advice that I want to give to anybody who has, you know, if you want to work in social media and in all media, um, or if you have like a daughter, whatever, I definitely recommend starting early. I was an athlete until I was a sophomore. And then when I decided to stop playing, I was like, okay, well, now I have to like take this career thing seriously and figure out how I'm going to do this. I was like extremely late in the game. So I definitely recommend even in high school, like all high schools usually have an athletics department. They have some sort of like soccer, football, basketball, something's going on. You can definitely just look and see if they have a video production internship, video production team. Like there's something always going on. And especially in college, like when I transferred to St. Mary's, I didn't realize that I was jumping into number one the one of the best men's teams in the nation for men's soccer and then number two our basketball team is NCAA tournament you know level so it was just great to just jump into that and I learned so many things right off the bat from going to a big school with that big athletics and that was just where I started was getting that internship with the video production team at my college so definitely take advantage of all the opportunities that are available to you. I didn't when I was younger, so please, please do that. And then when it comes to media, definitely find your the find the thing that you have most passion about. Mine was interviewing. That's what I wanted to do my whole life. Mm-hmm. It didn't happen until my senior year that I finally got to interview players with Path the Pro. But I learned so many other skills. Like I was thrown into broadcasting at St. Mary's for the men's and women's soccer team. I was just like, okay. And it was like what what Tori said, say yes. Mm-hmm. Say yes to everything. Like so when they asked me, I said, well I know soccer, so I I'm I can figure this out, I guess. You know what I mean? So and I, I ended up loving it and it's now a skill that I can bring into whatever team whatever career that I go into now and just yeah like just say yes to everything and let's see what else I mean social media everybody I feel like everybody's good at social media these days but there has to be something that you can bring to the table like be good at your editing skills work on your photoshop work on your you know video editing get have fun with it. Like go outside and just record your friends. Like go take pictures of your friends. Like that's what I love to do. (laughs) And just post like for Instagram and stuff like that. It's, I don't know, it's just an acquired love that I've just found. And now now I can bring it into the sports world. Yeah, exactly. Sheila, I know with athletic training, there's obviously a lot of schooling that goes into becoming an athletic trainer. Um, so can you kind of talk about the pathway and are there organizations to join and how, you know, just talk us through if someone is sitting there trying to figure out their major in college and say, you know, I want to be an athletic trainer, it doesn't have to be soccer specific, but kind of share that, that journey and pathway with us. Yes, um, I went to four year athletic training program Mm-hmm. I was um, playing soccer in D1 school, so I did both, and I think I was the first athletes to go through the program. I have to check, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure I was, um, and two years, you know, just a general athletic training 
uh, classes and, and, and junior year and senior year, we were picked 15, 12 to 15 of us were picked out of 200 students. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty tough um, major, but um, right now we do have DP, DAT program, doctor's athletic training program. And mm -hmm. you can actually go through the program in within five years, I think. Uh, there's a master program that that you can go as an athletic training but I did undergrad with athletic training and okay. um, grad school I did exercise physiology and sports biomechanics so you know there are a few options you can go to and I also have interns now that's um, that are PT physical therapists and mm -hmm. they take um, sports specific program and I with Sounders program, I always have one or two PT interns every year. Okay. And after they graduate, they do um, work with sports team like MLS team Seattle Sounders mm -hmm. as a physical therapist. So we do have physical therapists and athletic trainers under our medical staff. Okay. Are there any like athletic training organizations and different things like that? So yes, we are certified by NATA. Okay. Um, and then a, a different state has different license. So okay. if you move from one state to the other, you have to get um, state license. Okay. That's good to know. Tori, how, you know, some of us know how to be a low level basic ASO referee or, you know, Sunday league. So talk us through like the progression and, and all of the schooling and, and what that looks like and talk about the organizations um, that are out there that you're involved with. Sure. So you kind of start at, at your local youth uh, fields and get a grasp for the game, understand the, the laws of the game, and then um, you kind of can go up grade by grade by grade. So um, they changed the structure. So it's now grassroots referee is how you start. And then you would upgrade, you get a fitness test, you take a higher level test, you take some extra training and you become a regional referee. Um, mm -hmm. And then you do some additional training and then um, you take on some more games, you get looked at by a national coach. Uh, and then there's a selection process in order to get to become a national referee. Okay. Um, and so US soccer then selects, um, I think that's about 1% of officials in the US are national referees. Um, and so once you become a national referee, uh, then you have the opportunity to become a pro referee, uh, in which case pro would take a look at you. We have a pro two program, which is our development program. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's what I'm a part of is our pro two group. I'm in tier A, I'm happy to report promotion. I'm in tier Yay. A, so I'm in the top group. Uh, I believe I'm the only female in that group. So super excited to uh, be there. And it essentially means I'm one step away from the MLS. Um, while I worked in the MLS this year, I had three games. Um, I was just a trialist. So okay. my aspirations are to become a full-time uh, senior group of match officials uh, for MLS, which means uh, to get into the bargaining unit. Uh, mm -hmm. So I am on hold until kind of a spot opens up. Uh, okay. So it's a number of select positions that they have there for that. Um, so we have a number of guys that might retire in the next few years. So um, like other officiating groups like MLB and other groups, we kind of wait until a spot kind of opens up on the team, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you never know when that call up might happen. And then just be ready uh, physically, mentally and the others uh, to make sure that you're ready to perform. So it's really about, you know, Khalees said a lot about taking advantage of opportunities. It's going to tournaments. It's getting exposure. It's meeting higher level officials. You know, I always say, um, if you don't know what it's like to be that next level official, find someone who is and uh, aspire to be like them. How do they act on the field? What do they do? How do they interact with players and coaches? Um, how do they interact with their crew members and try and emulate some of the, the attributes that they have? And that's how you'll kind of grow and evolve and find mentors within the game, um, both male and female no matter your gender, there's mentors and people out there that are willing to help um, because that makes a big difference because yeah. we're all gonna mess up, we're all human, um, yeah. but you gotta be able to kind of continue on after you mess up, figure out why, uh, self-reflect on that and then move on. Um, put it kind of behind you if you can. But uh, yeah, that's the pathway to become a professional official in the US. Yeah. What's the timing of that? Cause it sounds like a lot of years and evaluations, like how, yeah. like, What's the, I mean, what's the average kind of window? Yeah, I mean, it varies. 
So I refereed, you know, for 20 years, but I did it okay. since I was a kid, right? Okay. And I wasn't very good when I started, right? <laughs> like, real hot, right? Um, but so, you know, there's players, you know, I, I say some of the best officials come from ex-players, right? I, I'm, I'm going to look at Cleese because I'm going to start to recruit you from the sidelines onto the pitch here. <laughs> but some of the best uh, officials are people who have played the game and know it at a higher level. I always try and talk to college teams and say some of those players are the best to come in and step into something like an officiating role where you can make some money, um, kind mm -hmm. of be in charge of your own schedule. Um, but it could vary. I mean, you could have a professional referee or professional player who comes in and within, you know, two, three, five years, they could be in the professional ranks. So I think it just depends on your skill set and your knowledge, um, okay. but it could be 20 years and it could be as short as five, perhaps. Right. Um, we've had a question for each each of you as far as the typical salary range, and you can you can be kind of you know you don't have to be exact, but if someone's you know looking into one of these, <laughs> I love, yeah. <laughs> Here, full disclaimer, people that don't work in sports think we get paid a lot of money and it's definitely like a passion of love. Um, but what, you know, that's not to, to stop people from doing what, what we're all doing, but is there like a, a figure range of, of payment and what you could like, what the career um, path or not pathway, but the career living looks like within each of your jobs? Yeah, so I can definitely start. Um, obviously, <laughs> the goal in this industry and my goal is to be obviously the Aaron Andrews of making yeah. millions of dollars by just interviewing professional players like all the time. Obviously, that's the goal. Mm -hmm. But as Carrie said, you have to love what you're doing because it is rough in the beginning mm -hmm. and I am right in the thick of it. <laughs> tell you. It's just, and I'm taking it, I take everything and I advise everybody and I'm sure everybody here on this panel can, can attest that you have to take everything as a learning experience and just be a sponge. And if you're not getting paid, you're still learning all the elements of your job and it'll eventually lead that's that's what i'm telling myself as a postgraduate i'm eventually gonna get there i <laughs> i have to do the work right now to eventually get there but um i think the average salary right now for sports media is about like 40 to fifty thousand dollars a year okay it's not a lot <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it goes back to that principle of saying yes and figuring it out. And, you know, like looking at my own career path as a coach, I was coaching college, but I was also coaching club to in doing summer camps to piece it all together because I loved it. And because, you know, I needed to put a roof over my head, but every, every new job, every new experience then, you know, got me a little further along and further along. So it, it's definitely, you know, a passionate a uh, career path and, and, but it yields great things. So Sheila, athletic trainers, what's the, what's the salary range? <laughs> you can go ballpark. You don't have to be specific. I don't want to make excuse, but it's difficult because athletic trainers, sometimes it's a PRN job, which is as needed job. Okay. So yeah. some teams hire athletic trainer just for the season. Okay. That's uh, important to know the differences. So talk, yeah, talk, talk. Yeah. And, and athletic trainers that are hired by hospital mm -hmm. clinic set up and then, um, cover, you know, season for the professional teams. Mm -hmm. Um, I know a lot of Academy teams hire athletic trainers for the games only, or, mm -hmm. you know, clinic, support the team so it's so many um variety of actual positions so it's it's hard for me to say but with usl championship league we did um survey and mm -hmm. it, it you know it's between 35 to 90 so right. you know it depends on experience and i know um each situation is different you know, mm -hmm. if you're full time, you get all the benefits from the company or league or club. And if they are part time, they just get paid for pay per hour. So mm -hmm. um, it's difficult to to do. Yeah. 
Well, well, that gives us a good picture of, of all the different nuances and, and everything. And it, it's, it's really interesting to um, think about teams that just hire athletic trainers for a game, because in my experiences, the players and the athletic trainers have a really unique relationship and it's, there's a lot of trust and things like that. And, you know, when I hear you talk, you're like, my, like you, you say that all the time, my athletes, my athletes. And, you know, you have that, that specific relationship, like a coach player relationship, but athletic trainer player relationship. So that to me, that's really interesting because that dynamic doesn't really exist when you just contract somebody for a game. But. Yes, and I express my feeling about academy teams having a full-time athletic trainers mm -hmm. because they are really the most uh, group that needed medical attention or supervision, really, because they grow so fast in a short amount of time. And, you know, sometimes knowing the soreness, mm -hmm. the initial soreness is better for us to take care of athletes better. So, you know, I'm just trying to spread the message you know, starting from Seattle and, you know, right. going outside to make sure that Academy teams has medical staff that oversee daily um, training sessions. Yeah, that's important. Tori, talk to us about referee salaries and making things work together. Sure. Uh, first, I just want to give a head nod to Sheila and something she just said about the importance of athletic trainers. I mean, you know, having gotten to the pro ranks and now at a level where we now have exposure to our sports science team, it's made a world of a difference for me and my performance on the field. Um, so I would say definitely like I can go to them and say, hey, this is sore, help me. And they give me these maneuvers I've never dreamt of. Um, <laughs> probably could YouTube, but like could never imagine. And they're like, push here, push here, and then it's done, right? Um, and so I definitely see the importance um, of having athletic trainers uh, that know your, your athletes day in and day out. I probably talk to my athletic trainer more often than I do my technical coach um, on the pro side. So there's that, but uh, really appreciate what you guys do, Sheila. Uh, so as far as officiating and salary goes, um, you know, it doesn't become full-time and salary really until you get to the highest level of the professional ranks. Um, and, you know, those guys are getting paid well in the six figures, right? And that's where I'm aspiring to be. Uh, until then, you know, I've pieced things together as Carrie kind of said, right? Um, you know, I was working full-time till this year was the first time I stepped back from a full-time position. I was in marketing, uh, similar to Khalees, I had a communications degree, I uh, was in the agency world and working full-time and then kind of doing officiating on the side. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of officials do is we do it on the side, uh, likely to something else as a profession. Um, there are guys that go all in in college officiating and can make a healthy salary doing that, you know, anywhere from 20 grand to 60 grand if they go all in uh, in the college game. But uh, mm -hmm. that kills your body because it's three months <laughs> of a lot of work uh, mm -hmm. and you're probably not doing it at your peak performance. <laughs> um, but all that to say, you know, officiating is, is definitely an independent kind of contracting work um, mm -hmm. for the majority of us that are doing it. Um, but it can be a great augment. You know, I, I shared on the other podcast that, uh, you know, I started when I was 14, I bought my first car with my officiating mm -hmm. money, right? Uh, so it's great for young kids that are looking to get paid cash uh, on the field. It's really great. And then as you be kind of become a passion, I found myself doing tournaments for free all the time <laughs> um, for learning and exposure. And we do that as officials. Uh, I see Carrie shaking her fingers. No, but, no, no. You know, <laughs> don't do that. You, is you kind of come up and then yeah. you, you build your wealth and your value and you don't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, officiating definitely, um, you know, I hope to make it a career, uh, something that women can look to. Uh, it's not something that happens today, uh, but I'm hoping we can make that happen uh, here in the next couple of years uh, and really open the door and kind of hold it open for those that come after us. Uh, this, this is something that they hopefully aspire to do. Right. Yeah. You know, don't give away your services for free. That's, you know, once you, once you push yourself, that's, that's something that I, that I think women are, can be a little bad at is negotiating. So I did a talk earlier today about as a coach, having an agent and having someone advocate for you and different things like that. So put a price to what, what you do, <laughs> put a price to it. Um, question for Tori and Sheila, what is the interaction between a referee and athletic trainers? And do you guys have any interesting stories uh, with that within within the game, like 
always stories. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila, you want to go first? Me personally. <laughs> in a game, I, wanna hear. I, I, I never talk to referee in a negative way. We are in the in the game and the same purpose, right? You guys are judging our game so that winners win. <laughs> and then and you are human and we make mistakes. You make mistakes. We all understand that. Coaches do arguments. I don't. <laughs> Only time I talk to referee is when we have to step on to help um, help my athlete. If you know referee um, rush me to evaluate hate, head injuries. I might have strong words. <laughs> Let me do my thing. <laughs> and, and, you know, USL league, we do have a set of referee that we know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we have a new ref and if, if he or she rushed me, they know who I am and I put my foot on but other than that I don't really talk to a referee and I have full respect of what you do you know when I was in high school I ref you know the kids game and I know it's tough and you can only see with your own eyes and you know a small area so I, I just have respect so I don't really have any issues Great, okay, Sheila. I'm going to come out and do some Sounders up. games. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, I think. I laugh. Yeah. <laughs> coaches, I think coaches, you know. Yes. You guys yeah. Hard no, times I, so that we can get a call and we understand the, the game. So right. I just laugh on the sideline. <laughs> very good. Very good. No, you know, I always try and find the athletic trainer in advance of the game, um, especially if I'm new and they, they don't know me perhaps. And I'll go and introduce myself, you know, in a neutral time, uh, usually before the game and just say hi, introduce myself, let them know that player safety is my number one priority, entertainment's number two, uh, but uh, player safety is number one priority. So if we see a head injury, we're gonna try and stop it fast. I try and articulate and be really clear. You know, Sheila said on the onset, communication is really important to her role. Likewise for officials, communication is really critical for us as well. So making sure that we're all on the same page of what my expectations are, if there is an injury, um, and that they don't rush the field, but we rather wait until they're waved on. I, you know, we'll do our best if there's a head injury to try and get the trainer on quickly, but try and acknowledge each other's roles and how important each of us exist, but why we exist and kind of create those boundary lines and expectations. Um, likewise, if I'm a fourth official in the MLS, I would do the same thing. I would even say, hey, you know, I'll walk down, make eye contact with you. Let's make sure we, we look at each other and acknowledge each other before we try and get on the field. So things like that, but just kind of setting the ground rules and how we're going to interact and exchange, um, I think is really important for the success of the match in general, but definitely for both of our performances as well. I shared with the group kind of before I had um, an athletic trainer who uh, was trying to dispute calls <laughs> uh, in a match. And it was the first time I had to kind of talk to an athletic trainer and almost consider cautioning them or sending them off. Um, and I said, hey, <laughs> that's not your job. Yeah. Um, so that was a first for me, certainly. Uh, but majority of athletic trainers are as professional as Sheila and definitely focused on their role um, and making sure their athletes are uh, performing at their peak. And uh, we're just trying to make sure that the game is facilitated in a safe and entertaining manner. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Stay in your lane, right? Don't, <laughs> don't, don't yell at referees. If you're a coach, if you're a coach, focus on the game. If you're a athletic trainer, do that. Yeah, we, we coaches can. <laughs> co coaches can get a little, coaches little crazy. <laughs> well, here's, I mean, I've coached for gosh, 30 some years. I have never changed a referee's mind by anything that I've said. So like, once you realize that you're just kind of like, okay, like, he or she has the whistle and anything that I say is not going to influence the outcome. So why, why even bother? <laughs> um, couple more, we're kind of winding down right now. Um, Lisa, I'm going to ask you, what are some of your future goals and what are some goals? Um, you know, what do you wish to see within the game, you know, how can women continue to impact the game and in different ways? Yeah, I definitely, obviously the goal is to see women in all different forms of 
the job, but especially in playing, I think that that's going to be really huge coming up in the next couple of years. And I, I'm seeing it a lot now that we're putting on our women's pro combine. I think it's super important that we get more exposure in the women's game in this country because it really does take a backseat, unfortunately, even though obviously it's proven that the women bring in the brass in the game of soccer in this country. Yeah. Um, but I think it's really important to give, you know, those NAI schools or the D3 schools, like the, the players that are that didn't make a D1 school, that didn't make a Pac-12 school, like the chance to have the opportunity to live out their dreams. That's one thing that's definitely worn my heart a lot with working with Path the Pro. Um, I think a lot of women just need to just say, just, you know, forget the haters, you know, and just do what they want to do with I have so many like females kind of like DMing me on Instagram like how do I do it how do I do it and I'm just like do you like every anything that you bring to the table that has your name on it make sure that it's perfect make sure that it's your personality and just I don't know it's just I think it's super important to just bring more women's personalities and more women's presence into every single aspect of sports because it's, it's only more diverse and I don't know, I think it's just going to be an amazing thing to see in the next couple of years, especially with the help of the women's national team. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, <clears throat> for, for people that y- you work with path to pro and, and for people that might not know much about that, it's, it's basically some player, player combines. Um, there's one in January and I've seen com- some traveling ones. You guys were in La Jolla last year sometime. And, you know, I was really excited, A, to be asked to coach within that. So I'll, I will be up there hanging out with you in, yeah. in January. And I'll be coaching a men's team and a women's team. Um, but it's basically a combine where players can come in and show their skills. And there's a lot of scouts there. I was super impressed. There were MLS scouts there last year for the men and USL scouts and uh, Liga MX scouts. And it's just a, a great, um, great atmosphere to help players achieve their goals. And with the addition of the women's portion of that, that is, that is amazing because, you know, the opportunities for women within the pro game is smaller for the players, for coaches, for front office, for referees, for everything. So, um, you know, giving a shout out to, to path to pro, but, that's it's a great it's a great program and um it it allows for a lot of opportunities for for people to follow their dreams so yeah and I think that I obviously the dream was to work in pro sports which I I am but the thing that I love most about Path to Pro is I get to tell the underdog story through my job you know I get to highlight the the people that aren't you know going to be the stars of a USL MLS team you know what I mean they're on their way there but they're not there yet. And we see so many of those guys and women's players that are gonna be coming through our combines now. And that's just the part of the game that I've honestly fall in love with. And I just think that our agency is gonna grow just off the basis of the fact that we're helping those players get to where they wanna be. Yeah, exactly. Sheila, hopes for the women's game and more women working in in the sport, more athletic trainers, all of that. Where where do you see it going over the next couple of years? Well, you know, Carrie, we've been working behind the scenes since what, 2010, 2012? Yeah, you, you, yep. Even at the league, you know, I'm not in the big, you know, influencer in the game, but as a, just the one of the athletic trainers, I want to make sure that our players get the best medical help and medical service um, as much as male teams and Mm -hmm. medical support for each team. Um, And just to, you know, have more athletes get an opportunity to, to either try out for the league or at least opportunity to showcase their talent somewhere. We mm-hmm. have professional league in Europe and now in Asia, um, we have a lot of professional opportunities in the world. 
not just with US, but other countries. So, you know, as I don't really want to say female, female, but, you know, we have to help each other, mm -hmm. you know, keeping, bringing the world together, really unified. And yeah. um, you know, even just the, uh, being an athletic trainer or supporter or, you know, coach, player, wherever you are, uh, whatever you do, you have a platform to help women's league. Mm -hmm. you know so but i think clissa if, if i'm wrong please let me know but twitter instagram i think nw nwsl had highest attention and so people wants to you know people are interested in female soccer 100 percent, and it's only growing like Obviously, Carrie, she's get, she's a head like assistant coach with next door to Landon Donovan in the USL. Like yeah. that's huge, huge yeah. stuff. Like she, I don't know. Like Carrie, <laughs> you're amazing. Obviously, yeah. like somebody that I look up to. But it just and I wanted to just know it starts off at an early age. Like tell your daughters, tell you know everybody that you know at a young age to let them know that they can do whatever they set their mind to. Like. My parents, especially growing up, I think that I have the mindset that I have now at the age of 22 because I was never told by my parents that I can't do anything. If I want something, I can go out and I can achieve it if I work hard for it. And I think that needs to be communicated to every single little girl in that walks this earth, honestly. Mm -hmm. They can, they can be the Sophia Smiths that, you know, are walking the same field that Abby Wambach played on, you know. Mm -hmm. If you guys saw that picture, that was, that was amazing girl on, on um, social media, but that was just amazing to see that, you know, her, her hero from when she was little is she's doing the same thing as her. And it's, it was, it, it just warmed my heart, honestly. Yes. Soccer, the soccer is a language, right? Yeah. We speak the same language yep. and, and, and play the same game. So I'm hoping to make the better world <laughs> you know? through soccer you yeah know? Uh, so that's what I'm hoping for I love that Tori how do we get more women involved in roughing and what does what does it look like for women um in soccer over the next couple of years what are your thoughts yeah I mean seeing is believing right mm -hmm. and so we need more women in positions in the higher level right I mean having myself um, you know officiate the MLS this year was groundbreaking it was amazing it was something that needed to be celebrated it's also time that we have more of us right mm -hmm. um, you know the fact that Don Garber mentioned uh, you know my name and the amount of women officials in MLS in his MLS speech uh, this past week uh, was amazing right it, it warmed my heart to know mm -hmm. that this is an area that people are looking to right uh, the work that Stephanie Frapphart has done, right, in the Champions League, yeah. arguably the best pitch, right, in in men's, in soccer period, right? Yeah. Um, she's really broken a lot of ground, but that's just one woman, right? And, you know, like Sheila said, we're stronger together. So we need more women um, believing that they can from a young age, um, but all the way through, right? We need to reach higher. We need to reach higher together and encourage and inspire each other, not break each other down. Uh, we need to build an empire of women, <laughs> right? Because we yes. can add value in this game. And, you know, I had a young girl ask me why I wanted to officiate in the men's game. And I said, because I feel like I can add a lot to this game that my male counterparts can't. And mm -hmm. there's a unique perspective that we bring. Um, you know, Sheila said, you can only see so much that you can see. Well, a mom has eyes in the back of her head. I don't know. Yes. If you know <laughs> We do, right? We just have a spidey sense that our male counterparts don't have, right? Uh, and we have a little bit more empathy and understanding that maybe our male counterparts don't have, right? We have these traits and attributes that some may have thought as weaknesses prior, but now we're starting to blossom and, and we know how to use them as strengths on the pitch. And I think that's a beautiful thing that needs to be talked about. It needs to be encouraged and um, you know, brought to light a little bit more. And I think the more women we have in this game, the more females we can have in MLS, and beyond, you know, my hopes are not just getting in the senior panel group, but also in the international field. You know, we don't yeah. have someone working in the CONCACAF league, in the men's league today. Um, mm -hmm. I hope to make that a change, not just for next year, but the years ahead and, and pull women up with me uh, as we do that, because we're only stronger together. So my hope is that you, you see women out on 
that field and it's not something new and radical, but rather uh, just another day at the game, another day yeah. at the office. And you don't really recognize us. You don't really, we don't stand out to you all. That's my hope. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, hopefully you, you, you touched on a point. Hopefully they stop putting female in front of our name, like female athletic trainer, female, you know, coach, female, just coach, just, you know, head, head ATC, head referee and, you know, head social media director. And, and that that's when we, we will truly know that gender really isn't in the equation anymore. Um, any, any final like words of wisdom, anything the three of you want to share as we, as we wrap this up, this has been really like awesome for me to, to hear from each of you, but any parting words? I think I forgot to mention in like the advice portion, I think all four of us can attest to never burn bridges. Mm -hmm. uh, connections are especially huge in sports. I know for me, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know and who I've known. And, you know, throughout my career in soccer and all of that, that's the reason why I've gotten to the place that I am today is because I've never burned any bridges with people. Connections yeah. are huge in this world, no matter what profession you want to get into. Just, you know, keep those connections, keep meeting people, throw yourself out there and be, just be vulnerable. And that's how, you, that's how you'll be successful, honestly. Yeah, good points. Sheila, Tori, any, any closing words? Well, for young, athletic trainers out there, sharpen your skills. You know, every day is learning opportunities and I learn a lot from my interns and other coworkers. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, be the best. Yeah, that's a great point. Never stop learning because everything's everything evolves so fast. The sports science, the social media, the rules, the, the speed of play, all of that. You know, what, what was good 10 years ago is obsolete now so a very good point tori any any words of wisdom final closing sure i think yeah you know, doubling down on something sheila had said earlier um you know she said you make the world a better place no matter what your role is in the game no matter your capacity no matter what level you're at you can always make it better um, for the people coming after you and no matter what that is right and focus on making the environment better the challenges and the struggles that you're facing someone else is going to benefit from those experiences that you're having uh, so it's not just for yourself to shatter that glass ceiling it's for everyone else that's going to come behind you they're going to stand on your shoulders and they're just going to raise the bar higher and higher so no matter what your level is no matter what your role or capacity is in this beautiful game um, we can all work to make it a better place for everyone behind us and I think that's really important for, for all of us to try and do yeah, for sure. So I want to first say thank you. I think Alicia from America Scores is going to jump back on, but I want to say thank you for to all three of you for giving your time um, and, you know, say a huge thanks for all you do within the game of soccer and it's inspiring and you are leaders in your space and I'm, you know, better, better knowing you and, and like we've all said, we're, we're better together helping women um, push forward and, and grow and achieve amazing things. So thank you each, each of you for your time. And I've really enjoyed uh, sharing this space with you. Um, I really wanna say thank you too. That was a really great session. Um, I want all three of your careers. Um, <laughs> I don't know how I would do that, but yeah. And um, Carrie, thank you so much for moderating this one one you did yesterday, the one you're going to do tomorrow. Oh yeah. <laughs> We've got you on the payroll. <laughs> I, think. Um, I just, Tori, what you said, empire of women. I don't know. That's stuck in my head. I, I kind of see that in the future. That's a really, uh, really cool thing. Um, everyone who's out there listening, thank you so much for tuning in. We have some, two more great days of sessions. Tomorrow morning, we have Heather O'Reilly. So it's a great way to start the day. And um, thank you to our partners, Goal 5 and Women in Soccer. And hope to see everyone tomorrow. And please stay safe and have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank Bye, you so everyone. much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.